Uh, we're going to jump in. We already have our guest speaker here tonight. We're going to jump in with the Mayor of Attleboro, who's running for sheriff from Bristol County. Paul Rowe, would you like to come up here and sit here, sir? Or would you like to stand? What would you like to do? You want to sit here? Okay. Welcome to Mansfield. Take it away. How much time do I have? I have you have 10 minutes and five minutes and 14 minutes. Excuse myself. <laughs> so it's, it's here, so I'm not having my back. Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. Over there, so yeah, I'm here on the side. You like us, yeah. But the mic is here, so speak up. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm in my third and final term there, and I wanted to stay active. And so I was looking at several different races. Um, the one I decided on was the race to show. This is, I felt the most uh, compelling need to run for this race. I think all of you know Sheriff Tom Hodge, you know, his reputation. Um, you know, he absolutely has to go. I mean, he, he is somebody who uh, is basically a mini Trump. I mean, he was actually Trump before Trump was Trump. And he is somebody who does a lot of harm to the communities down there. He talks tough. He talks like a tough guy. He acts like a tough guy, walks like a tough guy. Um, he says, nobody's going to be tougher on crime, when in fact, he is probably making uh, the situation in the communities throughout Bristol County worse by his uh, methods. You know, he, his attitude is... Let's make life miserable for people who come here, the inmates, whether they are awaiting trial or whether they are sentenced for a misdemeanor. Let's make life miserable for them. And if they don't like it, don't come back. That's his attitude. You know, I'm, I'm a criminologist. You know, I, I did my master's in criminology. I did all the coursework for a PhD. I just didn't do the dissertation. Um, I worked in jail. I worked in prison. You know, so I've got a background in this. And... There is nothing that supports, nothing in the academic literature or in you know, the lived experience of people who are coming out of jail or prison um, that supports that what he does actually keeps people safe. So I'm running for sheriff to get rid of And I'm wanting to basically take the Bristol County Sheriff's Office and the Bristol County Jail and make it a modern uh, example of what we can do with uh, corrections, you know, at the Level, you know, here in Bristol County. Um, what I'd like to do is that, you know, focus on several things. The security operation is all established by uh, best practices. There's no question about that. We don't really need to think about the security operation. That's keeping uh, inmates locked up so people don't get back into you know, that element of society you know, they're there. That, that's something we don't have to worry about. What I'm worried about are the programs or the lack of programs and whether or not they actually work. So if we're offering programs, we have to make sure the drug treatment program actually helps students drug offending after release. If we're offering an anger management program, we have to make sure that actually works for people after release because the people who are participating in that program are depending on that program. So that's one aspect of things I'd like to do differently. Another thing I'd like to do differently from the current sheriff is focus on the three pillars of prisoner reentry. Housing, that's the most important thing for somebody being released from jail or prison, in this case, jail. Um, housing, health care, and a job. So housing, you know, working with organizations to make sure that they, so when somebody's released, they have a place to go that night. Um, if they don't, that's a risk factor for ending up back in jail. Uh, health care, which includes mental health and drug treatment, but also if you're a diabetic, you can sure you have your insulin. It you know, covers everything. And then a the job it also includes uh, skills training or an education. So those are the three pillars of prison reentry. That's not going on right now to any successful degree in the Bristol County Sheriff's Office. And so that's something I'd like to prioritize. 
Um, the current sheriff likes to focus on uh, you know, immigration stuff. He's a tacit racist. I would I would to say tacitly. You know, I, I don't know if he thinks of himself as a racist, but he is. I have a picture of him, which you can easily find if you do a quick Google search of him. It was, he posted this picture on his official website, you know, the Bristol County Sheriff's Office website. He's wearing a Confederate flag for a tie. I'm not joking. You can, you can Google search it. You can actually Google He has a Confederate flag. He said, oh, I, I, when he was called out on this, oh, I just thought there was an American flag tie. You know, it has the red, white, and the blue, and the stars and the stripes. It's not even the same red. Now I'm colorblind. Okay, so I mean, it's like, and I know that, you know, I'm red, green, gold, and I can tell that it's not the same. So, you know, this whole issue about immigration, you know, if I get elected sheriff, I'm running a jail. Care, custody, and rehabilitation. That's what we're focusing on. Not all this other stuff that is fear mongering and just trying to, you know, get people to be worried, like, oh, just Sheriff Hodgson's going to keep us safe. But what's he doing? Just running his mouth, talking about you should be afraid of them, them, people coming over the over the border. You know, that's not keeping people safe. All he's doing is using fear to get votes and to uh, you know, just try and stay in power. But this is a winnable race. It's, you know, something that I can do. I can win this race. I've never lost a race. I could lose this race. This could be the first race I lose. Uh, I'm trying really hard not to let that happen. Uh, in my 10 years in politics, I've had eight competitive races. I've gotten over 60% five times. I've gotten over 70% once. Um, you know, so I, I know how to campaign. I know how to campaign hard. You know, if, if, I'm gonna show you guys something. If you want to see something kind of funny, see that tan line? That's not time at the beach. That's basically from days like yesterday where I was out knocking on doors. And I visited, I'm not exaggerating, 350 people. The vast majority were not home, but I was out knocking on doors. And I do that several days a week. Some days I visit 400 people. Some days I visit you know, 250, but usually it's about 350 to 400 people. Uh, June 21st is the only day of the year. I'll probably have about 450, 500 people that day. You know, what I do is I go out, I start knocking on doors at about you know, 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. I don't stop to go to the bathroom. I don't stop to uh, eat. I drink about, about 100 ounces of water and I still lose five pounds. Um, but I stay out until about 7 30, 8 o'clock. So that's, and I do it on a bike. And so that's how I'm able to hit. And I do that several days a week. And I started in May. And I'll be doing that right up through the primary and into the general election. That's only part of the strategy to win. Um, you know, but this is a winnable race. I, I did a poll in early December to see if I should even get into the race. For example, if you do a poll, you know, the poll result comes back and shows that your opponent is at 70%, you know, approval rating, you're not gonna beat that person. You're not, not unless that person runs over a child when they're driving down the road. You know, you're just not gonna beat that person. When I did a poll like it, it was professionally done, cost about five thousand dollars, reached out to twenty thousand people, six hundred people responded. It asked a couple different questions. What was Sheriff Hodgson's unfavorability? Favorability. His unfavorability was over fifty percent, so he's in trouble. It also, uh, my unfavorability was about thirty-three, thirty percent. Excuse me, my unfavorability was thirty percent. So another question was, who would you vote for? This was early December. I announced January tenth. Who would you vote for right now, Mayor Paul Garrow or Sheriff Tom Hodgson? I got 40%, you got 33. So he's in trouble. The only thing Hodgson has going for him, and I mean the only thing, is he has $300,000 in his war chest. He hasn't had a raise in 12 years. Uh, last month in the month of May, he raised $18,000, but he spent $25,000. So he's not, I, actually, I hope he keeps spending like that. By all means, please do. He's in, has lunches at country clubs. Literally, check his campaign finance report. You'll see it. Um, I raised uh, about sixty thousand dollars. Actually, I just did a deposit for about two thousand dollars before I came over here before the city hall. Um, but you know, the, so I'm, I'm raising the money. The money is coming in, and I have, I have a very lean campaign. I mean, we, we don't spend money on virtually anything. So uh, unless it's going to move my name, move my message, we're not spending money on it. So, um, but. I, I really hope you'll support my campaign. I want to run a modern jail system, a very forward-thinking jail system, a system that you know we can all be proud of. And you know, I'd like to get rid of Hodgson. He is going to be the highest-ranked Republican in the state after Charlie Baker leaves. Uh, because he'll have a, a 
Republican with the, the largest district of the whole county. So, uh, but I, I need help. I need basically four things. I need people to vote for me. I need people to donate. I need people to volunteer. There's all different types of volunteer activity. And the fourth thing is I need people to tell other people to do those three things, which would be four things. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, you guys all have a long card. Yes, sir. I have four so, I don't know Okay, so that's a really good question. As I've been going around, yeah. So the question was, how would I address? Um, how, how do I deal with the people who work for the Bristol County Sheriff's Office right now? Because a lot of these people are currently under hot suit. Here's the thing. I've knocked on literally thousands of doors already, and he is not well liked by a lot of the people that work with him. He has a, he, he, you know, he, some people love this guy. He's just like Trump. People either absolutely love him. It's like Trump in a lot of ways. People love him or they absolutely hate him. And as I've been knocking on doors, I've talked to a lot of uh, correctional officers or relatives or friends of correctional officers that he's not well liked. You know, he, he has a, a patronage system where, you know, if you support him, you, you'll get a promotion. If you're not in support of him, you oppose him, you know, he makes life really difficult for you. Um, I've got people in Attleboro, you know, like there's a couple of employees that routinely kick the crap out of me. And these are city employees on social media. They're always kicking the crap out of me on social media. They're just, they're, it wouldn't matter who the mayor is, they're gonna kick the crap out of me. I've never said boo about it. You know, they've, they've never gotten any discipline for that, except First Amendment right. But this guy, Hodgson, he has made a lot of enemies because a lot of what he does, um, you know, is retaliatory. So he has a reputation among a lot of employees uh, that, you know, they, they, want, they want change, they're ready for change. Another thing is that, one, you know, one of the other Democrats in the race is talking about, oh, I'm going to start slashing jobs and you know, all these patronage positions. Guess what? You start campaigning like that, you've already lost. Because not only are they, even if they want change, you have just lost the votes of those people that work there. You've lost their family, you've lost their friends. Um, so there's a way to, you know, change staffing without threatening people's jobs. Natural attrition is one of them. Changing jobs is another one. Saying we're, we're canceling this job, but we'll make it here for you. Um, you know, one of the things I'd like to get away from, and the police chiefs are all happy about this, is the law enforcement aspect of things. I get elected. Yeah, the sheriff has the authority to do arrests and stuff, but I, I, I want to run a jail. I worked in the Philadelphia jail system. I worked in the mass prison system. I've never been a cop. Being a cop is totally different than running a jail. Police officer is law enforcement, is criminal investigation, is traffic stops, jail, prison, corrections, care, custody, control, rehabilitation. Both criminal justice are completely different jobs, completely different mindset. So yeah, a lot of he doesn't have a good, that's a long-winded way of saying he doesn't have a very good reputation. Yeah, just as a follow-up question, um, are there any settings out there where you're aware of similar situations between people serious much more? Yes. So that. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So the question was: Are there case studies to talk about that that talk about coming into a system where somebody's been in power for a long time and going ahead and making change? I am that case study. Kevin Dumas is now the town manager here. He was the second um, longest serving mayor of Adelaide. I mean, like actually, but I can use personal experience. Kevin Dumas was the um, second longest serving mayor in Africa, 14 years. I came, I, I beat him in 2017, started off in 2018. He had appointed the majority of the department heads. Only a handful of them were leaving at the same time as him. New ones came in. And so I inherited um, probably two thirds of the department heads. I inherited two of those, and you know they are, they had a, a, a system with him.
but I also inherited about 300 uh, point deeds of boards and commissions. And, you know, so there, you know, I, I've done that before. And the first thing you have to do is uh, listen. Is that actually, but my two rules of doing the job that I do, you have to be honest, number one, because if you're not honest with people, they have to be honest with you, and you have to be honest with them. If you don't, if you're not that, you're not you're worthless to each other. So that's navigating a new system. This is what I've come in to say to all employees. You better be honest with me. If you're not, you know, then you're worthless to me. Is that time to? No. 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 <laughs> so um, that's number one. The second thing is you have to listen. Listening goes both ways. I'm going to listen to you because you have institutional knowledge. But you're going to listen to me because I'm also setting a direction for the institution. So those are the, the two most important things. Um, but I, I've done that before, and I'm sure there are. You know, people go to the Harvard Business School, and they'll have plenty of case studies about that. And those who are taking more and more verifications. But I can just say from my own experience, I've actually done it. And I've also, having been an assistant to the commissioner on the Philadelphia jail system, that was a jail system of 9,500 inmates. Bristol County is 1,500. And so uh, we had a much bigger jail system there when I was directed. And I, I worked directly commissioner, so I got to see somebody managing the jail every single day. And I also worked for the Mass Department of Correction. I didn't report directly to the commissioner, but I worked a lot with the commissioner and uh, Tower Clark. And so, you know, I got to see that, that management as well. But um, yeah, it, it's, you know, when you go into a new organization, you have to establish, if you're going to be honest with me and I'm going to be honest with you. And number two, we're going to listen to each other. Because those are perhaps so, and Question, yes, sir. I know. I can explain that. And I'm wondering if you know So the first one, uh, Charlie Baker endorsed Hodgson because Charlie Baker hates me. He really does. In 2015, I humiliated his uh, director of budget and administration, Kristen Lepore. So the question was, um, you know, why did you, for the people on the video, why did Charlie Baker endorse Hodgson when they seemed to be so different? So Hod, I mean, so what happened was Kristen Lepore was a lobbyist with the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, and she was part of Charlie Baker's campaign team. And so he made her the Secretary of Budget Administration, which at the time in 2015 was supervising a $40 billion budget. I was on the bond committee, and she came down and she gave a presentation, and it was one of the worst presentations I've ever seen. I mean, it was, it was just horrible. I mean, she, she didn't. She was misusing economic terms. She didn't have answers to stuff. She had the worst part was the optic of this 31 inch, 32 ounce, I'm sorry, 31 ounce, like gulpy, 7 Eleven gulpy soda. And she's sitting there sucking away on that thing and putting it down. It just looks so unprofessional. And so I called her out on that. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, Charlie Baker, you know, they, they did not appreciate me uh, saying that she gave a terrible presentation. And so he has campaigned against me and lost every time he's campaigned against me. Uh, in, you know, he's, he's endorsed all of my opponents and the mailings against me, and he always loses. So for Charlie, he really liked Chris McQuarrie. He, um, you know, he, he basically, he's just, he, he doesn't like that because I embarrassed his uh, secretary of administration finance early on. She eventually ended up becoming the chief of staff if she, she left that position of as Secretary of Administration and Finance. She was way in over her head. I was the first person to call her out on that. So I'm the bad guy. Um, on the flip side, Hodgson wants that endorsement from Charlie Baker because Hodgson, at this point, kind of wants to distance himself from, uh, from Trump a little bit because he doesn't want to look like such an extremist. So Hodgson is welcoming that endorsement because it, made, it makes him look more like a moderate. But Hodgson is not a moderate. He is a Trump sycophant. He had that, that um, Confederate flag tie. I mean, he is what he is. I mean, he's, a, he's a racist. He is a sadist. And, you know, that's um, that this is what he is. So and there was another part. Too. 
Oh, the, uh, yeah. And there's no yeah. yeah, so I never asked for endorsements anymore. I stopped asking for endorsements in 2014. I haven't sought out an endorsement for a race. In fact, in 2014, I was out endorsed when I was running for re-election as a state representative. I was out endorsed by a landslide, and then I won by a landslide. And then in two, I didn't have an opponent in 2016. Then in 2017, Kevin Dumas, um, he had an entire eight and a half by 11 page of endorsements, and I didn't have a single endorsement because I didn't ask for it. I don't ask for endorsements. Sometimes people just give them to me, and that's fine. But I pride myself on, you know, basically this: endorsements don't win races. Hard work does. I visited 350 people yesterday, just yesterday. You know, I, I did 400 people. I think on Friday. I mean, so that's that's what I probably knew Saturday, one ago. Um, Saturday. Uh, you know, that's what I pride myself on, not endorsements. I just don't ask for endorsements anymore. I haven't. If somebody says, Paul, I'm gonna endorse, it, um, okay, great, thanks, appreciate that. But I, I don't make a big fuss out of it because endorsements don't win races, hard work does. And like I said, uh, you know, I'm always out endorsed because I don't seek them out. I just, I just don't. And I kind of take a little bit of cocky pride and then I'll win in landslides when they have all these endorsements over here. And I didn't have any and, uh, because I've all worked people. I just buy them. So, you know, if somebody wants to, that's fine. But, yeah. So, any other questions? Oh, very good. So, uh, anyway, I hope to earn your support. It's a winnable race. I'm the best candidate to win it on the Democrat side. And, um, you know, I, I you know, can reach out to my website or send you an email. Yeah, I'll leave it at that and take whatever prompt. Mary, I want to thank you for coming. Thank you. And I uh, wish you well and hope you do well. Okay. You're absolutely correct. We need a new sheriff. Yeah. 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 I really want the Sun Chronicle to be the sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you for coming. So we have guest speaker uh, Beth Griffith and for him Abbas, I believe the spelling is uh, from the Coalition to Protect Workers' Rights on computer at the time. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, would you like to hear you loud and clear? Okay, you guys are up. You're up to speak to the group at the time. Excellent. Can we present on a slideshow? We're working on it. Okay, let us know when we're good to go. I'll, uh, you should be able to know. Okay. 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 Uh, Beth, you want me to do it? Sure, you could do it. Okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, the town committee, for having us uh, present today. If you can't hear me or I have any questions, well, if you can't hear me, let me know. Questions for the end, please. So my name is Reem Sorry? I thought I heard something. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to adjust the volume from here right now. Okay, do you want a second or do you want me to repeat? Okay, we good to go? Try one more time. Okay. Can you, can you hear, hear us now? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that sounds great on our end, too. Well, thank you so much for the town committee for having us. My name is Rima Bassi. I'm an organizer with Mass Not For Sale. My colleague, Beth Griffith, is here. Uh, we're here to tell you all about the campaign and ask for your support coming up in November. 
uh, where a uh, campaign were looking to beat big tech on their ballot question. We need to defend the rights of workers, consumers, and taxpayers all across the Commonwealth. So what's our fight about? Right now, we have the strongest labor laws in the country. Uh, they ensure that all working people have a minimum economic and civil rights uh, levels at work. Right now, the big tech gig economy companies ignore these laws, pay less than the minimum wage, which they get away with, and they don't pay into Social Security and other taxes. Um, A.G. Maura Healy, who's running for governor, who's fully endorsed us, by the way, is suing Uber and Lyft because of their employment practices, where uh, misclassified as contractors rather than employees. A true contractor can set their price, set their hours, set everything, but unfortunately, we cannot. So in response, um, they're filing a ballot question that would permanently exempt these companies following the law. No other industry has this. No other industry has this, just to make it clear. So the ballot question would create a permanent underclass of low wage, mostly immigrant, black, brown workers, and really rip off the customers and the taxpayers and endanger the public completely. So what they did is what they're doing and uh, what they're doing here is what they did in California and they got away with it. So because of the law, uh, drivers and gig workers in California are fully considered independent contractors. And because of this, in Massachusetts, this language would fully exclude 300,000 and growing app-based low-wage workers, mostly from these marginalized communities, from all the wage guarantees, benefits, and civil right protections that our laws here in the Commonwealth guarantee. I'd like to just interrupt here because Uber and Lyft, DoorDash, these big tech app-based companies can actually function within our labor laws. They just choose not to do it to allow these 300,000 plus app-based workers because they're greedy and they don't want to share their wealth with workers like Rahim and myself. They can comply with our labor laws at any time. They're just choosing not to do so. Yeah. And instead of spending $100 million paying their workers, they're spending $100 million to try to disrupt our labor laws. Absolutely, thank you, Beth. And by the way, all the flexibility and independence they promise to their drivers, they give to their uh, corporate employees who all make a lot of money and it's a very uh, top-heavy organization. So what would this ballot question do? One, it would allow them to pay a sub-minimum wage as little as 480 to an hour. Now, this doesn't isn't just an arbitrary number. This is based on studies done in California after uh, Prop 22 was passed, and um, you know this is this is something that it can't allow here. We have one of the highest minimum wages in the country. Uh, it would also allow that big tech like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and Instacart to not pay any Social Security contributions. They get a special exemption. The wor our workers, us gig workers. If we retired today, we wouldn't get a penny in, in Social Security. And the other thing it would do, removes most anti-discrimination protections from app-based workers. Uh, so they have a little bit of a token healthcare stipend in, the, in their proposed ballot initiative. And it would only, only less than 10% uh, of our, our drivers and workers would qualify for this. And it would eliminate a 113-year-old worker compensation rule just for these gig companies, think about it. No other company has these exemptions. And they can continue arbitrary, unfair, discriminatory deactivations. There's absolutely no process to get rehired or reinstated by these companies. Beth and I field calls all day by drivers. We personally may have been deactivated, I have before. There's no way to get your job back, even if you did nothing. One errant complaint from a customer or a rider can lead to you losing your job forever. forever. Many, many drivers, go out and they save up their hard-earned uh, money and they go out and they buy cars, $30,000, $40,000 cars. I know personally, I'm looking for a car right now. The car I want is $35,000. So if I bought a car today and I got deactivated tomorrow, that would be extremely bad, it plunge me into poverty. So these companies would also cheat the unemployment rules. Uh, like we saw under the CARES Act, thankfully, gig workers like us, 1099, 1099 workers, as long as we're able to show that we paid taxes in the previous year and we're working, we're able to get unemployment. Under normal rules, we can't, and under this, we would also not be able to. 
So the most important thing to remember is that we're asking for a no vote here and that it perpetuates a false choice of flexibility. The purported flexibility that these uh, companies offer doesn't exist. Uh, we don't, we're not flexible. We're only flexible on one thing. It's how much you want to work. You want to work more or even more. You want to work 60 hours or 80 hours. There's no real flexibility. They don't give flexibility on pay. I just filled up my gas tank. It was about $5.17 here in Boston. And they didn't give us any flexibility on that too. And also really important if you're a writer, it shields the companies from liability. Um, the so-called million dollar insurance policy that they tout all the time, it only goes for the passenger and property damage. It doesn't go for the driver's car or the driver themselves. Many, many drivers are killed in the line of duty of gig worker after all, uh, as gig workers. After all, we are essential workers and uh, you know we're not getting a penny of that. So the myth of flexibility that we have flexible scheduling, again, it's only to work more hours it's not about your, you know, anybody can work any hours, but you can't make any money doing that. You can't pay bills. You can't pay the rent. You can't feed your family. And we can have it under current law. The, we had a hearing in March with uh, some members of the Joint Committee of Financial Services, and they asked this question. They said, what is the difference between now and then? Why can't you offer this so-called flexibility now or then? They can. They just don't want to. And they did in California. When AB5 passed in California, overnight, they switched the app into a, a real independent contractor status where the drivers could pick their own, own fares. They can't do that. So on the platform, and in this year's platform too, they talk about labor and workforce uh, section and stopping efforts by these app-based employers to mis misclassify gig economy workers as independent contractors, identifying them as, uh, excuse me, Denying them workplace rights by justifying subminimum wage, unbenefited jobs to many already uh, marginalized workers, which would have a devastating impact on the future of work in our state. It's also important just, to remember that, Yeah, go ahead. I would like to interject here. So the most pulling words in here is the last part of this statement, which would have a devastating impact on the future of work in our state. This ballot measure doesn't just affect at-base workers, so the people that drop off your groceries and deliver food to you when you don't feel like cooking, or make sure you get safely to and from the airport and to and from your job. This would actually impact all types of work. This proposition passed in California and thousands of unionized workers that worked in grocery stores lost their jobs with their paid time off, their pensions, and their benefits. They're trying to do this to nurses in California. They wanna do this to mechanics. They already tried to do this to mechanics here in our own state of Massachusetts. This law will affect everyone. And if your employer has an issue with you, they'll just deactivate you. You know, you won't be able to sue for discrimination or sue for sexual harassment or sue because they violated your religious beliefs. This impacts us all. This impacts our children and your children and your grandchildren. And so, some people might not care because they think it doesn't affect them, but it actually does. Because why would an employer spend more money to have you as an employee if they can force you to become an independent contractor and have to, and you would have to be forced to fight for every penny that you make? Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, also important to remember that this doesn't set any framework in terms of automation, which is really important in the future of work in our state. So when, when eventually drivers are thrown into the street because uh, all the jobs are automated, there isn't any framework for that either. That's what they're betting on. So our lovely Senator Elizabeth Warren, she has many, many great quotes. She endorsed us many times over. Uh, she said, instead of following the, wall, the law like thousands of Massachusetts employers do every day, giant geek tech Giant tech companies 
like Uber, Lyft, and Instacart are trying to use their money and power to exploit their workers and shield themselves from liability, said Elizabeth Warren. Let me say it loud and clear. These Silicon Valley employers need to follow the law, pay their taxes, and abandon their $100 million lobbying campaign. So this is going to be the most expensive ballot initiative in Massachusetts history, and also the law that Uber passed, which was extremely good for them in 2016 that legalized them in Massachusetts. So remember, they operated in Massachusetts completely illegally for about four or five years. They spent $50 million around that then. And that then was the most expensive law passed in Massachusetts. So here's our endorsers, uh, Warren and Markey. Markey stood at our table and gave us a good soundbite at the convention last weekend. Uh, 26 state senators and growing, 26 state reps, in, uh, sorry, 46 state reps and growing. Uh, Michelle Wu, among many other uh, city councilors, many city councils and town committees and town uh, meetings have also endorsed us, passed re resolutions in, in support of us. Many community organizations, civil rights organizations, faith orgs, environmental groups, and uh, the labor organizations such as the AFL, CIO, are extremely important players in this fight. This is a, a list of some of the community endorsers. Uh, Jobs with Justice stands out, JALSA stands out, Sierra Club, Progressive Mass, New England United for Justice, uh, Myra, um, many, many, NAACP, you know, these are, these are um, uh, associations that would have endorsed Uber and Lyft four or five years ago, but they've, they've seen through um, the lies. They've absolutely seen through the lies. So what now uh, Prop, make, Prop 22 makes possible in California, it's gonna gut unionized and well-paying jobs like nursing, executive assistance, tutoring, programming, restaurant work. What it could do is anybody whose job is scheduled on an app right now, such as re retail workers who pick up shifts, trade shifts, or are generally scheduled on an app, uh, they could be immediately um, transformed into gig workers, meaning their health insurance is gone, their uh, pensions are gone, no more 401k, no more sick leave, any of that, and all those protections that come with that. It's not about just the perks, it's the cons too. So today what we're doing and what we're asking of you. So one, you've already done step one, applaud you for that, is invite us to talk to your member meetings. Extremely important that we get the message out because of the misleading language that big tech is using. Uh, it's very important to remember that it's a no vote on this campaign. We are the no campaign and we hope to have your vote as well. So invite us if you have other organizations, community orgs, town committees, county committees, state committee, well, we talked state committee already, but uh, other committees, even you have a small union at work, um, whichever organizations you are a member of, just get at me, I will drop my contact info in the chat and Beth will as well. Call us, text us, Snapchat us, TikTok us, we will come, we will speak. Um, the other thing is survey your membership. Uh, let's talk to drivers. Uh, many, many people are gig workers, whether they know it or not. Uh, everybody knows or is friends with or has in their family uh, someone who's a Uber or Lyft driver, a delivery worker, or something like that, Instacart shopper, things like that. Uh, social media support. If the, the minimum level of engagement, just like and share, like and subscribe, that's it. It's super easy to do. It takes a second. I just I sit on Twitter all day, just liking tweets, retweeting. Um, it's really easy. And also really important, we're trying to build the broadest coalition in Massachusetts that we can. So recruit other community-based organizations into our fight here. So if you have, again, like religious, cultural, uh, trade organizations, things of that nature. So here's a QR code, uh, please scan it and it will, I believe it leads to a volunteer sign-up form. What I'll also do, I'll also drop our um, solidarity, oops, um, solidarity form into the chat for y'all. And if there's anything you wanna add, Beth, now's the time. What I would like to say is we are happy to speak. If you're a teacher, especially a civics teacher, we would love to speak at your school. We would love to speak at your mosque, your temple, your church. Also, if you have children, especially high school children, high school age children, and college age children, and they're looking for an opportunity to volunteer and participate in this movement, because this is history in the making. 
as we know it. We are more than happy to help your children get their volunteer hours. Also, we are looking for people to go door to door. And we are, like Raheem said, we are more than happy to give a presentation wherever we can. And we appreciate every, every single volunteer, even if you can only give half an hour or even an hour a week, we greatly appreciate that. And does anyone have any questions for us? And uh, I'd like to also reiterate that had we been given a little more notice, Max put this on us. Max is a great guy, but he's very busy. We'd, we would have loved to join you in person too, because the message is much more effective uh, that way. And it's always great to meet and greet and, and network that way as well. But any questions from the crowd? And our, my contact info and the solidarity card, pledge card is in the chat. Uh, website, find us on Twitter, Facebook, all that. Um, let's open the floor to questions. I'll let the moderator do that, excuse me. Uh, can open up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? We can share after the game. That's why you do that. Maybe the slides could be shared too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have plenty of info. Uh, we can share. Was that the only question? I can't even hear that. About the slides? Okay, I think we're all set. Okay, folks, thanks so much. We hope to see you soon. Definitely see you on, on our canvases, so look out for us. Yes, thank you so much for having us. We are grateful for the, the opportunity to present to you all. And please, I also posted our Facebook link. Please like us, follow us on Facebook, and ask your friends to like us and follow us on Facebook as well, too, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.